The general social survey shows that, quote, no religion has been rising and is now slightly above evangelical Christianity. Interestingly, this doesn't necessarily mean more atheists. It's more of an umbrella term capturing a group of people who prefer to have no official religious affiliation. I won't be advocating for the conversion of anyone here. Instead, in an effort to explore this shift in religious affiliation, I invite you to see from different perspectives. I've asked five people to join us today and share their experiences and thoughts about doubt inside and outside the church, and I've outlined some questions to help guide our conversation. This is Kaya Sweeney. He is a father and engineering student. Uh, have I ever had doubts in my faith? Uh, the most significant ones came when I was... Oh, living in Seattle, um, I was I was away from all of my friends. I was away from uh, everything that was familiar before. The ones I was living with, my sister primarily, she has definitely lost her faith, I guess. Uh, and her perspectives, I I don't mistrust them because I I know her thought processes. I know that she has an analytical mind. I know that her conclusions come from an initial perspective of faith. So uh, observing that was kind of a catalyst to my own not-quite-crisis, uh, just a, a time of testing where I had to really think hard and consistently why I believe what I believe, if it's worth believing in, um, and being able to cement that. This is Zachary Daniels. He considers himself an independent thinking believer and follower of Jesus the Messiah. Have you ever had doubts in your faith? Uh, sure. So when you're growing up, you're just sort of an information sponge. And you believe you have that authority bias where you believe people in authority actually deserve that authority and that they're actually right in what they tell you. And so with that in your brain as a, a young information sponge, you don't tend to question it. Like, well, that adult just told me they're the teacher and the student, and then you just try to absorb that information and go with it. And then you get older and you start to see that the authority figures in question don't necessarily know what they're talking about. And so once you decide that the authority figures aren't trustworthy, then you have to start questioning the information that you took as gospel. When I went to college at 16 years old, I started having my assumptions challenged, and that shook me because I, I, had to, I had to ask myself the question, do I really believe what I've been taught, or is it just something that I took for granted? This is Emily Allison. She's a drummer, a missionary, and an advocate for mental health. Not in who he is. Um, there's never been anything that I've doubted. I've definitely doubted, like, what are we doing right now? Or, like, why am I doing this? But, um, never, like, that it's real or who it, that God is who he says he is. This is Jordan Stoddard. He is a small business owner and student at Lambda School. Um, you know, if I think about, if I talk about myself in the context of, you know, my family, and if I said, Something like, I don't know that what we believe is really real. Um, you know, I know I would, yeah. Yeah, and some people would be like, well, so you don't, you don't believe in Jesus? And I'd be like, no, I do believe in Jesus. Um, I believe in God, and I believe in the things that I was taught. But I'm just saying that, like, I choose to believe them, right? And that's what I'm saying, is it's a belief, not a fact. There's no way for me to know with 100% certainty. There's only a way for me to believe. So... Um, I'm not saying that 
anything that somebody in a church says or does is wrong or incorrect or but it's just we don't really know. So if I say to a Seventh day Adventist, you're wrong in your belief, but I say to a Foursquare person, you're right in your belief, what's the difference? Like how it's the Bible, but how do we even you know, every word inside the Bible only exists because we as people have agreed that the, that the, the words that are there mean what they, we say they mean. But what do they really mean there? I mean, they're, they're really, other than us agreeing on it, they don't exist. The meaning of the word doesn't exist. Are you saying words don't exist? Words are made up. Yeah. All words are made up. This is Philip Saldana. He is a self-made socialite. I've never really questioned God. I mean, even if there isn't a God, it's still nice to live for something. The existence of God, I don't really struggle with that. I struggle with my willingness to follow his path. You could suppose that everyone's had doubts at some point in their life. But do these doubts have a place in faith? Do you think that doubt has a place in faith? Oh, it absolutely has a place in faith because without it, faith isn't really faith. So I think that there's a place for doubt, and I think that that's part of like the choice that we have, and that's part of like the beauty of it is that we can have the doubts and then still follow him anyways. You should have a healthy level of skepticism. And that does not apply simply to faith. It should apply to all parts of one life, and faith being part of a life should also be subject to it. But doubt implies evaluation of the thing, as in it is probably not true, versus skepticism where it's saying that might not be true, let's test it. Skepticism uh, is a, a very good analytical tool. It prompts you to create questions, and questions are the only way you can really learn and progress. When you're a kid, right, and you're raised to believe something, you, you don't question it. Um, there's no reason to question it, you know, it's like you're parents say that something is what it is and you just believe them because they've taught you everything you know. You realize that those things that you learned as a kid were just things that you learned as a kid. And as I said, they're, they're sort of like constructs that... Uh, real quick, the term construct refers to a model of something that you've made that doesn't fully capture the essence of that thing. I built in my brain that I've made a like that have been wired into my brain that are like make sense that allow me to make sense of the world in a way that I'm not so that I'm not like um, crazy. But it's like I said, as you get a little older and you see that well, not everyone was raised that same way, and they have different constructs. Um, you realize well, why would my construct be more valuable than theirs? It's just what I learned. Um, but it's not necessarily a higher degree of truth than someone else's. Do you think doubt has a place in faith? Yeah, I do. Um, I think there has to be that person or that thought that grounds you into reality. Like, what if this isn't real? Like, I, I think blind faith is an actual faith. I mean, just being told to believe something, being told that, oh, this is real, believe it, and just blindly believing it, I don't think that's really testing you or developing you. I think having that doubt really solidifies when you come on the other end of that doubt, okay, this is what I believe. This is what my focus is. Um, so I think doubt plays a really big, really important part in, in developing who you are as a person. How has your faith changed? So in that case, you you started to question 
what you believed, what people had told you mainly, and how did you come to land sort of where you are today then? Uh, I decided that the risk of not believing and the sort of vapid lifestyle that that would produce in my life wasn't worth the uh, jump to faithlessness. And I also had experiences with a being that I perceived as being God. And so because I talked to God in my ordinary everyday life, it made me believe that he existed because I, I, I knew that there was some, someone hearing me and in some sense responding to me. I believe God is experiencing uh, his creation in real time. And while he can make predictions extremely accurately, everything is not set in the future. Having God be a being that is okay with eternal torture for people don't get it right for various reasons. Because I think most people don't get it right uh, even even among people of who I completely agree with theologically, uh, who can know their hearts other than God. So we all have things that we have wrong, and to punish someone eternally based upon a lack of knowledge, you know, it says the people perish because lack of knowledge in the Bible. And so perish is a different word than the people are tormented forever because of lack of knowledge. I don't think God would do that. I think that would make God a certainly ambiguous being and not a good one. Um, I think it's changed in the sense of um, it's not like black and white stuff anymore. You know, I think when you start out with anything new, you're like, this is all black and white and this is how everything is. And then you kind of slowly realize how much gray area there is in a lot of stuff where you just have to approach everything with love and grace. And there's some stuff that's black and white, and there's some stuff that's gray, and you just figure out what it is. And you go from there. I think it's altered from an initial point of uh, not the harshest of conservatism by any means, but I was definitely more conservative in my faith when I was younger. I think what's changed primarily is that facet of it. It's sort of been smoothed down. Um, because I, I accept certain things that a lot, other, a lot of other churches would not. I accept that homosexuals and LGBTQ communities, they are also worthy of love of God, and they are able to attain it. A common doubt some people have is when they face what science has to say. So, can we be science-minded Christian? Could we be science-minded Christians? Of course we can. We have to base our beliefs on something. It's empirical. If right. God exists, then God will change things. If your life changes based on your belief in God, that makes faith evidence of something. If your life doesn't change based on your faith in God, then that means that that faith has no basis in reality. I absolutely think we could be science-minded Christians, like, because, so we're so worried about science disproving Christianity, right, or, like, the possibility that because of evolution or whatever that it's going to, like, disprove what we believe, but there's so much that, first of all, faith, so, like, you can't prove everything, that's the point, because we're not, that's the point, we're not supposed to be able to prove everything in a scientific, like, matter-of-fact, rational manner, that's part of thing and second of all there's stuff that is like like science is real like the way that water boils at 100 degrees celsius and freezes at zero degrees celsius the way that the solar system works and i think that there's something really beautiful about the way that science and math and they all kind of come together and the way that things work out so perfectly and beautifully in a way that's so not random like there's no way that it could be random so why wouldn't we want to be able to understand pieces of creation that are so perfectly intrinsic and detailed and put together that we could 
Like there's the way ecosystems work and the way that um, baking happens, you know, like the science of like the science is everywhere. There's no way that you can avoid that. And so I think people are really concerned about evolution, basically, as a science that could disprove God. But I think that science proves God's existence more than anything. Do you think we can be science-minded Christians? Yes. Why? Because the future of Christianity demands it. We are living in a progressing, a progressing world uh, that is driven by science and the economics of greed, but the true progression of mankind is dependent on science. And if we cannot reconcile our faith with that, our faith will be left behind. The original language um, that the Bible is written in, in which the creation story is um, originally given, the periods of time are not specified, strictly speaking, as days, as in 24 hours, and are more analogous to periods of time in which things occurred. So from the perspective of a certain group of Christian scientists, uh, the idea is that evolution is not wrong in saying this is how life has developed on the earth. Do you think we can be science-minded Christians? Yes, I mean, I, I do, but there are fanatical scientists and there are fanatical religious people who can't find that middle ground. Um, but, I mean, there are so some people who are, you know, sand in the line, the earth is 5,000 years old. It's like what are you? Are you serious right now? Um, so, I think there are people who have a scientific mind that are faith based, um, but you always hear the arguments for one or the other, and never that like middle person. Like, oh yeah, I believe in dinosaurs, but I also believe in God. Like, I think the two are real. I do believe that people can be both scientific and religious well i mean if if you can make that step towards maybe the earth isn't six thousand years old whatever um how does uh, evolution fit into that yeah no like who says that god didn't start that whole process i mean that whole amoeba like it's easy to say oh god gathered dirt and like bam there's adam um it, I don't see why I don't see why that transformation couldn't have happened. Just to follow that little thread, why do you think there aren't more people who believe like these two almost intention uh, things? I think it's because of the Bible and people literally taking every every little verse in the Bible literally. So we've talked about doubt, faith, and science, but we haven't yet talked about the way in which we come to accept something as truth. Or simply, how do we know what we know? Or epistemology. Your epistemology is the method that you use to accept truth. So how do I know what I know? How do we know what we truly know? How do I know what I know? How do I know what I know? How do you know what you know? You have to sort of trust that you are not crazy, you're not a crazy person, that you're a rational being and the conclusions that you come to are based on your own sort of anecdotal experience. And that's how you know what you know. So, for example, you think that um, your own experience is trustworthy, that fooling yourself is not easy. Oh, fooling yourself is very easy, and deceiving yourself is, is easy. You kind of have to be a trustworthy person in order to trust yourself. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, I understand that about human nature that it's easy to trick yourself, and so I'm, I'm wary of myself, but I still have to trust myself. 
but I still have to trust conclusions I draw based on my own empirical uh, life experience. How do I know what I know? I, through life experiences and through the experiences of other people that I try to steal and pretend like are my own, um, that's yeah. how I know things. I think it's a mixture of like experience and then bouncing that off of other people, right? Because you can experience something, but if you're delusional, then it's not real. And if you can, you know, have other people tell it to you, but if you've never experienced it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's real for you either. So I think it's a mixture of like what I've experienced and then what other people have told me about their experiences, what other people have told me about what they see in me, about what I think I know about myself, and then it's kind of like the combination of those two things. How do we know what we truly know is as simple as being able to have experience and believe in it. I think that I have been coming to terms with more and more, especially as I get older, which is that I actually don't really know anything. Um, or that I don't have certainty of anything, uh, because I think certainty is, it is kind of like, a, it's a, it's a construct of consciousness, and we as humans label things, um, and we create these, these like, little, um, we make things reality in our brains that aren't actual reality. So, you know, I could say like I'm sitting in a chair, but it only is, that's only a thing because as a, as a collective, we've decided to agree that this is a chair. The scientific method is based on the epistemology called empiricism. Essentially, you come to accept truth as something you can experience and test, and some things we ultimately have to treat as an opinion that isn't supported by evidence. When you were reflecting on your faith, um, as you as you put it. Do you think that if you were like in a church context, if you landed somewhere that wasn't Orthodox Christianity, do you feel like you probably would have been rejected? Only if it ended up not in favor of my faith. For some people, their faith, communities, and even their paychecks can be rooted in their belief system. And that can make questioning how you come to believe something to be very scary, let alone questioning your fundamental beliefs. It can make you feel like your whole world might end, or that you're completely alone in an otherwise crowded life. For anyone that feels this way, you are not alone. We started our discussion with mentioning that there's a shift in the labeling uh, some people have chosen for themselves. And sometimes this has to do with the process of deconstructing ideas that have been handed to you. So instead of handing you ideas of my own like many have before me, I'll just leave you with some questions. Is what someone believes what makes them good? Should we love doubters even when they lose their faith? Does being certain make you right?